mainstream nutritional ideas are that resistant starch is second only to, um, you know, an apparition from the Virgin Mary or something. It's yeah. like, it's so holy and wonderful. And I remember when I first learned about resistant starch, the narrative was all, it's great for your microbiome, eat as much of it as you can. I ordered some like potato starch on Amazon and I was just throwing like resistant potato starch in my food. And this is, this is a totally different um, a paradigm shift to say that that starches or or even do you think soluble fiber could also do this because it's going to feed the microbiome and it's going to increase gram negatives and then we can get into some discussion of soluble versus insoluble fiber but soluble fiber found in things like beans or grains yep. lentils um, this I, I, this is an interesting piece of like sort of the Ray Pete philosophy that you've d done so much good work to discuss with people and, and promulgate is this idea that like, this is, I think it's so fascinating that, that increasing the microbiome in the colon, the, like the full number of bacteria and the populations may not always be a good thing for people because then you're getting more gram negative bacteria, which are going to turn over. You're going to get this lipopolysaccharide part of the cell well, also known as endotoxin. And we know, I don't think anyone would argue that when endotoxin moves across the colonic lining into the bloodstream or even the small intestinal lining into the bloodstream, we have massive problems. Yeah, and the, the soluble fibers, uh, specific, I think there's very, there's very good research, research showing that pectin, which is in virtually all processed foods out there, especially the yogurts and any of the milkshakes that you're drinking, almost all of them have even modified cornstarch, which I love. I mean, there's no there's no need to discuss because it it's also GMO, and this is like it's got its own problems now showing to be allergenic because of the genes that have been modified. But pectin itself is now being shown to be strongly associated with all types of GI cancers, the of the large intestine, of the small intestine, and even gastric cancer. And also with liver cancer, which kind of demonstrates that uh, pectin probably increases not only the endotoxin, but also the its absorption into the bloodstream because endotoxin is now known to be a known carcinogen for hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, so the, all of these, everything that can give the, this bacteria to feed on, specifically the uh, carbohydrates, whether they're resistant or not, it's going to create a problem. Now, the reason uh, we're saying like eat more easily digestible carbs, not, it's not because that they cannot feed this bacteria. It's because they get absorbed before they actually get re that reach the, col the column. And in people with low metabolism or chronic inflammation, some of that bacteria starts to creep up into the small intestine. And now there's an officially recognized condition, SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And, and people are given this antibiotic, I think it's called rifaximin, which is non-absorbed, right? Yeah, it travels through the through, through all the all the three portions of the GI tract, and it has a remarkable effect not only on the SIBO, but these people feel generally better. Their inflammatory markers go down. Uh, their total cholesterol, the LDL uh, total and LDL cholesterol go down. Um, the CRP goes down. So it looks like just just this presence of the bacteria and all of its end byproducts are not good for us, right? So it's good to keep this bacteria probably in check. Several studies notice that people that are preparing for bowel surgery, they often get very high doses of, of antibiotics to kind of completely sterilize the intestine. I think it's like a, a, a cocktail of neomycin and gentamicin, some kind of a strong cocktail combination. So they get it for several days before the bowel surgery. And then after that, uh, doctors notice that these people do remarkably well and actually lose weight, depending on how, how sterilized their gut is, to the point where <laughs> these people actually started asking the doctor, hey, I mean, I don't know what you gave me before the surgery, but after that, you know, I feel really well. I don't, I don't put on the pounds as easily. The doctor thought, well, maybe it's because of the surgery. We, we resolve whatever problem you have. But little by little, other, other studies have been done and noticed that animals that are kept with completely sterile guts, which is not practical for humans, but just to illustrate a point, they cannot get weight even on a very high fat diet. So you, you pump them full of calories up to four times what they would normally eat with a, with a colonized GI tract. And then, and they don't get weight. They don't, they don't get fat. So something about this bacteria, and now we think we know that it's mostly through the chronic inflammatory reaction that, that kind of occurs with every meal, but, you know, it helps to keep that one as low as possible. And the way you do it is make sure you eat foods that first don't irritate the intestine mechanically, right? Uh, make sure that they're not as toxic as these artificial dyes that are now known to actually uh, be, be probably toxic to the, to, the, to the cells that are lying in the intestine. And three, just, just things that do not feed the bacteria. So... Uh, the small, the, like the simple starches. Now, I know uh, uh, Dr. Pete preferred fructose and uh, sugar from ripe fruits. Uh, I think that's fine because a lot of um, other studies have shown that if you actually consume as much sugar as you want from ripe fruits, you also don't get weight. So there's something in the fruit. Maybe it's the fiber because they also contain a lot of insoluble fiber. Maybe it's some of the flavones and flavanones, especially in, in citrus fruits. Uh, 
bottom line is if you're eating simple sugars, especially if they're coming from natural sources, they don't seem to cause this like pro-bacteria, pro-endotoxin effect. And you living in uh, Costa Rica, you probably <laughs> have access to a lot of ripe fruit. You know, or, you know, uh, ruminant meats and ripe fruit is probably what we were kind of, I want to say, born to eat um, and thrive. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing, I mean, partially inspired by by, by you guys, I've been doing a lot of orange juice, fresh squeezed orange juice every day. Um, and I'm, I'll do mango juice. It's, it's been an interesting experiment recently. I got a juicer and I'm just trying to do, and this is something that kind of harkens back to my days as a pure carnivore, as little fiber as possible. So I'll do four mangoes in a juicer and then I get this big mug of, of mango juice with much less fiber because what I've seen, and this is so interesting, is that most fruit has some soluble fiber and some insoluble fiber. And so my gut definitely feels quieter when I have less fiber overall and I'm trying to get the simple carbohydrates. And I've been interested in that for a while, this fruit as a source of carbohydrates for humans. I do a lot of maple syrup and honey in my diet. And I don't do any starches. I've never done any roots because I was kind of concerned about the resistant starches and then other plant defense chemicals in the roots, whether it's solanine and choconine and the potatoes or oxalates and things like that, that I kind of wanted to avoid. But I just think it's so interesting um, that, that the soluble fiber can feed the bacteria in the colon and potentially cause imbalances. I don't think we're suggesting you want to sterilize your gut. Like we oh, talked no, no, about. I said it's in, impractical, in, yeah, yeah. Impractical for humans. But it is interesting that some of the foods that we eat that have traditionally canonically been told to us as healthy, like lentils and beans and grains, could be contributing to this problem. And things like starches, cornstarch, resistant starch, cooked and cooled potatoes. I mean, that's a favorite one for people for resistant starch. You probably don't want to do that or you want to have some metric on the back end to make sure that your endotoxin isn't going up. So one of the more interesting things I came across was this um, LPS binding protein. Yeah. Have you ever yeah. seen anyone measure that with a lab? The next time I get my blood work done, I want to get LBP levels, you know, L LPS binding protein. I mean, you as a doctor can probably order it. I have not seen a way to order directly from one of these direct-to-customer labs. Like, they just don't list it. I mean, they may be able because they have a doctor on staff too. They just don't advertise it. And I called several of them. They said, no, we, I mean, we know about it, but it's not on the list and we don't want to do something that's like off the list. Um, but uh, it's, I think it's a very good biomarker. Another one that you mentioned, the last one is soluble CD14, uh, another a biomarker of endo chronic systemic endotoxin exposure. Interestingly, it's a very good predictor of mortality from HIV. So now it tells you that maybe even things like HIV, like chronic viral infections, are actually driven at least the the, the you know the the long term dangerous pathology associated with them may be uh, driven largely by endotoxin. HDL is actually a very good one, which most labs have. Now, if you have elevated HDL in the in the in, in the setting of a normal LDL, chances are you're dealing with you know uh, some kind of endotoxin assault. I've seen it very often rise in people who have had like a, a bit too much to drink, to, you know, a couple of nights before. Mm -hmm. And uh, ethanol is, is notorious, number one, for increasing the permeability of the, of the GI tract. And second, ethanol itself is an activator of TLR4 and an activator of 5-HT3. So, so a lot of the bad, uh, um, you know, effects of ethanol, it, because it's just the, the alcohol of acetic acid, it is an energy molecule. You should, we, should be able, we should be able to metabolize it. Uh, it looks like a lot of the bad effects of ethanol are due to uh, its pro-endotoxin effects and also increasing endotoxin absorption uh, into the gut itself. And if you block these, which several studies have done, ethanol is just this basically another benign energy source, just like sugar. So I remember the study that where they gave an, um, animals uh, a 5-HT3 antagonist known as ondansetron, and then they gave them basically liberal access to ethanol to the point where 40 or 50% of the calories of the mice came from alcohol. They were perfectly fine. Yeah, they were drunk, but they didn't develop any liver problems, um, fattening of the liver, like fibrotic changes, and they were doing just fine. Um, so, yeah, so things like that, basically, HDL maybe, uh, most doctors should be able to do or at least order it. And I think the HDL, the HDL to LDL is can also be uh, a good indicator, even though now it's, cons uh, I think it's used as a um, uh, biomarker for, uh, for heart disease, recently got challenged because um, there are many drugs in the market that are trying to raise HDL because for a long time, uh, doctors were saying, oh, it's a good it's the good cholesterol, right? You want the LDL low, the HDL high. But all of these uh, drugs that are trying to raise HDL uh, artificially invariably flopped in the clinical trials. In fact, several of them increased dramatically the risk of, of uh, uh, hemorrhagic strokes, which is really nasty. It's uh, probably oh, yeah. even more dangerous than the ischemic type, right? Uh, and they said there's something about HDL that, you know, we don't understand. It's most certainly not a good cholesterol. Well, its main role physiological is to actually carry 
endotoxin from the bloodstream back to the liver for, for you know, for neutralization and excretion. So if you have elevated HDL, uh, which ethanol does, right, but many other things can do, unexplained elevated HDL is more often than not probably an indication of uh, high endotoxin in the blood. Yeah, LD, HDL is a little tricky because I think that there's probably some genetics based on the kinetics of HDL. Different HDL subtypes move at different speeds. And I've seen people with different levels of HDL. I think that it, when I'm thinking about HDL, I might ask people like, if you're insulin sensitive and you're healthy and you right. see where your HDL is at, and then you do something like adding potatoes to your diet or cornstarch, or, you know, you drink a bunch of alcohol and you see the HDL go up, then you might see that. But it's, yeah. it's just so tricky because, um, yeah, some people genetically have HDL of 40 and they're probably metabolically healthy and some people have hdl in the 60s and that's just where it, it lands and so it's a little trickier one but I, I do want to try and get some of these labs that i work with to measure lbp the lip, lipopolysaccharide the, yeah, the most LPS. the most effective is probably going to be the one the that most would be really that would be really cool